I'm going to um, first go over just the basics of the FPI and HBCA load routines and their um, standard keywords for the uh, users who are on who aren't familiar with HBCA and FPI and SpeedS. And then I'm going to go into um, generating energy, pitch angle, and gyrophase spectra from the uh, distribution functions for both FPI and HBCA using MMS part get spec. And then we're going to cover uh, generating 2D velocity at energy slices directly from the distribution functions. And this is using MMS part slice 2D. And then we're going to show uh, how to combine the time series moments and spectra um, that you can uh, load with the load routines, generate with the spectra, and generate with uh, the 2D slices and combine them into a single plot with MMS Flipbookify. And finally, we're going to go over visualizing the distributions in three dimensions using MMS part IC3D. So just for the standard introduction to the load routines, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, if you want information on the FPI and HPCA data sets or the variables that are loaded by the load routines, I suggest going to these links, the lasp.colorado.edu, um, essentially the MMS SDC data sets page for each instrument. And be sure to read the release notes. And if you have questions about the data sets, um, email the contacts for the instrument teams. They're most knowledgeable about the data sets and the variables produced. And if you're looking for more examples um, outside of this webinar, all of our examples are in projects, MMS, and examples. Uh, there's three folders, or four folders, I think. Um, basic, advanced, webinars, and quick look. The basic examples are just simple examples showing how to load the data. Um, advanced shows more advanced functionality, like uh, some of the stuff we're going to show later with MMS part get spec and the slice 2D stuff and flip bookify. And uh, the quick look generates our scripts that generate quick look plots at the SDC. So those are the plots you'll see if you go to this page, the SDC site at last, and just click the quick look link. And there's also a webinars folder under examples, and that's where we hold this script will be and all of our previous webinar scripts are. So for the each FPI and HPCA load routine have the standard keywords, which is T range and probes and data type level suffix. Um, one important thing to note is that data type depends on the instrument. So check the header of MMS load FBI or MMS load HBCA if you um, want to change the data type. I am going to show all the data types down here um, as examples. But if you get confused or forget which data type exists for which instrument, just check the header. And an important note <clears throat> is that most load routines in SpeedS and um, every other MMS load routine in SpeedS loads the data at the um, each measurement is at the center of the accumulation interval. Um, the one except or the two exceptions are the FPI and HBCA load routines. They load the data um, where each time step is at the beginning of the measurement interval. And you can adjust this using the center measurement keyword to the load routines. Um, and essentially all that does is tell it to adjust the time stamp so that the data is at, um, at the center of the measurement rather than at the beginning of the measurement. And as I mentioned, FPI and HBCA are the only MMS load routines that uh, require this keyword. And I should also note that there are many more uh, keywords available in the load routines. Um, check the header if you want to dig in deeper. So just as an example, load FBI. So we have keywords for uh, saving the CDF file names. Uh, saving the CDF versions, returning only sp specific CDF versions, uh, downloading the data from SPDF instead of the default of the last SDC. Um, you can also change the data rate. So there's really good documentation of how to use the load routine and the various keywords available in the header. And uh, another thing to note is that <clears throat> The load routines use defaults for keywords that aren't explicitly provided. And to find the defaults, 
<clears throat> use uh, check the header of the load routine or the first few lines of the procedure. For example, uh, that default data rate should be fast, although we don't say it in the header. So right in the first few lines of the procedure, we do set all the defaults. So you can see the data rate keyword isn't set. We set it to fast. And of course, we default to probe three for FPI and level two. And I think that's pretty much all you need for an introduction. So let's go ahead and load some data. So I'm gonna load some moments data for electron and ion moments for FBI. So let's go ahead and go to pilot run. <clears throat> so another thing to note is that the keywords generally accept uh, both strings as well as arrays of strings. So I could have said just to load the desk moms to load the uh, electron moments, but instead I learned about the, the electron moments and the IO moments by specifying it as an array. And as I gave it a T range and a probe, and I told it to time clip the data. So another important keyword here, if you load MMS FPI data without the time clip keyword, it may load more data than um, the T range that you request. And this is because, um, what we do is, what the load routines do is go out and grab all of the data within that time range. And if it includes data that's outside the time range, it dumps that in there as well. And we do that because it's more performant. Um, it actually takes a lot of time to time clip some of these data products, especially if there are a lot of variables being loaded. Um, so we go ahead and just leave it up to the user to specify the time clip keyword. And let's see. So we went ahead and plotted the, uh, ion number density and the ion energy spectra. You can see we have that now. And actually I'm gonna change my console so that you can see the plot here. So you can see the ion density is in uh, green. So that's kind of annoying. So you can actually change pretty much anything in these plots using the options so what you do is you call options with the variable name. And then if you want to change the color, uh, I just set it to zero for black. And if you call an empty plot or an empty call to tplot will replot the window um, with the current settings. So if you change an option and call tplot, it'll replot it with the updated color. And so uh, now we'll try to load the data for HBCA, the moments data. So it's just a call to MMS load HBCA. And note again that the data type is different for HBCA. So for HBCA moments, it's just moments. For uh, But the other keywords are the same, T range, probe, time clip, and center measurement. And so in this example, what we did was load the HBCA moments and then add the number density variable to the top of the plot. Use calling tplot with the number density and then with an add keyword. And you can see now, now the HBCA variables or var number density is at the top. So does it do all species or looks like you just have protons there? Did, did you specify the species somewhere or are they all loaded? So they all load. So all and define, define which ones you just call tplot names and it lists the current variables. And you can actually use wildcards. So we can say number density. And you can see it loaded H plus, HE plus, HE plus plus, and O plus. And so you could add these others. So we want to add the O plus as well. To the top, we just say tplot, then add. There's the O plus density. Um, one big difference between the FPI moments files and the HBCA moments files is the FPI moments files actually have the energy spectra uh, saved in them. Um, the HBCA moments files save the energy spectra in a data type called ion. So to, for example, to load that data, we just change the data type to ion.
And these files tend to be very large, so it can take uh, a few minutes to load these ion files. And these moments count files are they're pre-calculated moments. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So one more thing to note, um, so to generate an energy spectra um, versus energy, you actually have to, there are a couple of, or a couple of routines that you have to use for HVCA. So I'm gonna, first I'm gonna show why by pulling apart a t-plot variable. So let's, I'm gonna get the data from a t-plot variable, the H plus flux that was just loaded from the ion files. Data is now stored. It's returned by this data keyword D. So D dot X are the times and D dot Y are the data values. And you can see that, uh, I think that's 63 energies or, and 16 angles. So the flux data is actually a function of energies and angles. So if you say D, D dot V1, this should be the angles and D dot V2 will be the energy values. So to actually create an energy spectra, you have to um, do two things. First, you have to sum over the full field of view, that's the over the A nodes, and then you have to do a spin sum. And I think technically you have to do a spin average. And to do that, you use the routines MMS, HBCA, Calc, A nodes, and you specify the field of view, which is just 0 to 360 for the full field of view. And then uh, MMS HBCA spin sum, and the average keyword tells it to average instead of just summing. So after calling both of those routines, it creates a bunch of uh, t plot variables, and it uses e it actually generates it for each species. And at the end of the variable name, it has the the elevation, which is from the calc a nodes, and then it has underscore spin which is for the spin average. So now if we get data at variable and look at it, it should just be a function of energy. So there are now are 24 times and at 24 and each time there are 63 energies. And that's the energy table. So now we can go ahead and plot that flux. Actually, no, we're gonna, yeah, we can plot that flux by just doing that, and that's the flux. But I wanted to plot it alongside the FPI ion flux. But the uh, FPI moments files actually have energy flux units instead of flux. So we can convert the HPCA flux uh, to energy flux. And so first what we do is call get data on the, the flux variable. And this is the omnidirectional flux variable for H plus. And we save the data with the data equals D. And I'm also returning the metadata with D limits. Um, so just as an example, showing again that uh, data, the D dot X is the times and the D dot Y are the data values. And then metadata. <clears throat> so the D limits returns a structure that has uh, information on the original CDF files. Um, so you could say help. Oh, uh, CDF has all the original variable attributes and stuff from the CDF files. Um, it also includes plot information, like whether or not it's a spectra um, or whether or not it should be on a log plot, uh, whether or not the data was actually centered on loading the data. So if you're ever uh, looking for information about a data product, um, usually the best place to go is the delimits keyword and return the metadata and dig into the metadata. Um, so as I mentioned, D dot X are the time values, uh, D dot V are the energy values. So if we want to convert this flux variable to energy flux units, we just multiply each data point by each uh, energy. And so for example, 
Uh, one thing to note about this is append underscore array is a routine in speedS. Uh, super useful because you can efflux the, the array that you're appending to the end to doesn't actually have to exist yet. If it doesn't exist, it creates a new array and starts it. Um, that's why it's so useful. You notice that efflux isn't defined anywhere. Although uh, now afterwards, after this for loop, it should have the data stored at efflux. So to create an HPC efflux variable, we, we do the opposite of get data and call store data. And the first uh, argument is the variable name. So just call it HPC efflux. And the second is uh, just give it the data keyword and specify the structure uh, definition. So the X values are the same time values as before. The Y values are efflux values and the V are the energy values. And we could uh, tell it the delimits and give it the delimits, um, the metadata, but it said it not to just to show how to create a tplot variable essentially from scratch um, with no metadata. So all you have to do is give it times, data values, and then for spectra, the, the energy points for the data values. And you can see now, so on the top plot here, we've plotted the uh, FPI energy spectra, and that's the ion energy spectra. And then we have the HBCA efflux. Um, since I didn't put any metadata in there, it doesn't know it's a spectra yet, and it doesn't know to put it on a log scale. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Um, and again, we do that with the options command. So we say options, give it the variable name, tell it the say, spec equals one for the spectra, and then say y log to turn the y axis into a logarithm scale. And same with Z log, that turns the color bar into a logarithm scale. And Z title sets the uh, title of the color bar. Y title, of course, sets the Y axis title. And Y subtitle is where we generally store the units for the Y title. So you see, just calling those, setting those options and calling tplot, it turned that HPCA H plus uh, energy flux into a spectra. And so since this is uh, this is actually it on the same units, you can actually compare them now. So another routine that's really useful in looking at spectra is called flatten underscore spectra. And what this does is create a line plot of spectra <clears throat> at a certain point in time. So just as an example, we'll just call it. And then if you call it without any time set uh, in the keywords, you just uh, call it without specifying a time. It'll allow you to select a time from the plot, from the current plot. Um, so you just click anywhere in the plot, and it creates uh, energy spectra at that time. And so you can see it has the, uh, so this is the, oop, the z-axis units. And they, so it's energy versus energy flux, or energy flux versus energy. And of course, if you had more uh, energy flux spectra on this panel, it would plot each one as a different line. And this is one of those features that you definitely have to be running the bleeding edge for it to work because I recently added a keyword uh, bar and that draws a bar where the energy spectra was created. And so you can, just to show it again, you can create another one by calling it all over again and plot. And this one's at a completely different time. And so there's a new routine. It's very, very, very new called flatten underscore spectra underscore multi. And this accepts an input variable. And the input is uh, the number of plots to create. So what this does is actually create multiple uh, spectra at multiple times. So if you say flatten underscore spectra underscore multi at four, it'll allow you to select four different times and put them on the same plot. So for example, we could do one here, one here, and it should be sending them to this plot over here. It's hidden down here at the bottom. You can see another one, another one. So we only had four, so now we have the Spectra at the four different times that we selected in a single plot. 
And I'm definitely still working on features for this. So if you uh, run into problems or uh, have any suggestions, please email me and let me know. So one thing that might be useful, and maybe it does this, is if you could select um, what the delta time is that it uses to make this. Because you might want to increase statistics a little bit by not having it just be the instantaneous. Um, yeah, I think it, I think it does. Okay. So let's, and you can uh, begin by going, by opening the routine and looking at the header. And so you can, there are a few different ways. You can set the time range to average over a time range. You can set the number of samples to, to, um, to average, or you can set the, the window, which is the length of seconds over which the data will be averaged. So there are a bunch of different ways to okay. get the statistics. And both flat inspector and flat inspector multi should have all the same uh, features. Another useful tool for loading and plotting the FPI data is the MMS FPI ang ang, and this creates angle angle plots, um, as well as angle energy plots and uh, pitch angle energy plots. So let's go ahead and generate those. And the one argument that this requires is the time that uh, that you actually create the energy plots at, or the the time that you create the plots at. So for this example, we are, let's see, it has to load the support data. Yeah, and so I chose a time that was essentially in the center of our T range up here, just uh, 932 and told the species ions. So from the upper left, we have a uh, zenith flow angle versus energy. And the upper right, we have energy versus pitch angle. In the bottom left, we have azimuth flow angle <clears throat> versus energy. And then in the bottom right, we have azimuth flow angle versus, uh, or zenith flow angle versus azimuth flow angle. So this is that angle angle plot. And you notice on the angle angle plot, we actually have pitch angle contours. So you can see the, pit, the, the peak and the ion uh, distribution here is uh, 180 degrees and zero degrees. And the pitch angle contours are automatically added to the angle angle plots and you can control them with, you can turn them off with no contours and you can change the energy range, with the energy range keyword. And so I think that's most of the, the basic stuff, the introduction. So let's move on to the MMS part, get spec. This is generating uh, spectra from the distribution functions directly. And those of you familiar with uh, how we used to do things, uh, you might have used MMS part products before. So MMS part get spec calls MMS part products after setting up all of your support data and it does all the, the work for you essentially. So you should be able to get the spectra in a single call to MMS part get spec without setting up any support data or loading support data. Um, so if you're using MMS part products, I suggest moving over to MMS part get spec because um, there's significantly less, you're significantly less likely to make a mistake uh, with loading the support data. And another thing to note is that when you call MMS part get spec without specifying an instrument, it defaults to FPI um, and defaults. I think it defaults to electrons, but we can check by just opening the routine, looking at the first few lines. So defaults to units of efflux and fast data rate and electrons for FPI. but I specified the species as ions since we were looking at ion data in the introduction. So might as well generate the ion spectra. And so here we go. So the top panel is the uh, ion spectra generated directly from the distribution function. The bottom spectra is the uh, energy flux is uh, generated or actually loaded in from the moments files provided by the team. And 
for some reason. Didn't load the pitch angle distribution, but we can load that later. So the next um, one thing to note is that when you call MMS part get spec uh, for instrument equals HPCA, it automatically centers the measurements. And that's because some assumptions that we make internal to MMS part get spec, uh, the measurements have to be centered to do the calculations. So we automatically center them. And it should tell you in the output centering the measurement to the middle of the measurement interval. So does part get spec, uh, do we also use that to recalculate the moments? So you can, but there are important differences between uh, the moments that generated by MMS part get spec and moments released by the teams. Um, in particular, like the FPI moments, they have uh, photoelectron corrections. And we recently implemented our photoelectron corrections, but there are minor differences. And I'm still looking into why there are minor differences between ours and the, the teams. So I definitely, for moments, I, I suggest going with the team's moments for now. Um, and if you generate moments using MMS part get spec, be sure um, to talk to the team about, about the differences. So it sounds like get part gets that can more or less replace part products. Then, if uh, yes. you can, if you can get moments from part gets spec. So actually, MMS part gets spec calls MMS part products. Oh, okay. So, so internally, MMS part, yeah. But the, the thing about MMS part gets spec is that it actually sets up all the support data and loads all the support data that that you need prior. So if you want to do a transformation to uh, a field aligned quarter system, or if you want to subtract the bulk velocity, it, it loads that data that's required. And then it passes it to MMS part products. So I definitely suggest using MMS part get spec rather than MMS part products across the board. So in this example, we generated the uh, HPCA H plus energy from the uh, energy spectra from the, directly from the distribution function. And again, we called tplot with an add keyword. So we added it to the top panel. So HPCA is on the top. And then we had our, our FBI example um, comparison from before on still on the bottom. And the great thing about MMS part get spec is that we have keywords that allow you to control the calculations. So for instance, if you want to control the energy range, just specify uh, energy and give it the range that you want to generate energy for, or you want to limit the energy to. So for this example, we're loading from, we're generating the ion distribution uh, energy spectra from the ion distribution functions for energy zero to 300 EV. And energy here is always uh, an EV. And now we have the, you can see, we have the area. We went ahead and plotted it. This time we didn't add add, so it just replaced the current t-plot window with um, the ion energy spectra. And it's, there's a zero from, or from zero to 300 EV. And again, you can do the same thing with HPCA. Just tell it the energy between zero and 300. Isn't the minimum energy for FPI uh, ion instrument around 11 EV though? Yes. Why is it starting at zero? Uh, so I could do 11 or 11 just, uh, zero just means I'll go all the way down to, to zero or get as many as possible. It, it'll include that last data point. And you could be exact, but uh, you don't need to be. Or at least not for what I'm doing. And I actually chose the zero to 300 because uh, this is an interesting case later when the, with the 2D slices, there's a bi-directional beam there. We will get to in the next section.
So there are lots of keywords for controlling these calculations. I didn't uh, point this out earlier, but you can override the defaults that um, the default support data that this loads, such as the velocity data, the mag data. If you want to supply a different tplot variable containing the mag data or the position data, um, you can override the defaults using keywords. Um, let's see. So now we have the energy spectrum. We went ahead and added it to the top of the other plot. So now we have HPCA uh, energy spectra and the I, or the FPI energy spectra, both generated between zero and 300 dB. And so remember earlier the HPCA data actually stored the data in flux rather than energy flux. Um, we could generate the data in flux using units equals flux. And remember earlier when I showed the defaults for MMS part get spec, uh, the units default to efflux right here. But if you specify flux, um, you can generate that as well. You can also specify units of distribution function. It'll just return the distribution function. So I think that's DF. And let's see some other keywords that are useful. So if you're generating a lot of different spectra, um, you might want to use the suffix keyword, apply suffixes to, um, to the output variables. And I've been showing the energy keyword for limiting the energy range. There's also keywords for limiting phi range, theta angles, uh, the pitch angles, uh, the gyrophase. And so you can change the output types using the outputs keyword. And of course, in the header, we have a list of the available outputs, um, energy, for energy spectra, and then phi for the azimuth spectra, theta for the latitudinal spectra, gyro, gyro phase spectra, then PA is pitch angle spectra. And I'm gonna go over the multi-pad very, very soon. And the multi-pad is essentially the pitch angle distribution at each energy, which allows you to generate more, more than um, multiple pitch angle distributions at different energy ranges very, very quickly. And that's very useful because of how long it takes to actually do these calculations. And so now we're comparing um, on the top, the HPCA ion flux generated um, directly from the distribution functions with the HPCA ion flux uh, provided by the team on the bottom. That's from the CDF files. And some other useful keywords, MMS part gets spec are the add B field dir and add RAM dir. Um, these add the uh, B field direction and the spacecraft RAM direction to the uh, the angular spectrograms. That's the theta and the phi spectrograms. So go ahead and show that. And note here that I, I set the output to uh, theta and phi for the theta and phi spectrograms. Um, output accepts both, important thing is the output accepts both an array of strings or just a string with the options separated by uh, spaces. So you could do what I did here, or you could say this is an array of strings. Um, this way is just a shorthand, the single string with spaces. It's a shorthand for the same thing. So if you look carefully, you can see that there's a plus and a minus and an X. The plus is the positive B field direction. The minus is the minus B field direction. And the X is the spacecraft RAM direction. And there's, since there are only a handful here, um, by default, it for fast survey mode, uh, it adds it once every 60 seconds. You can change the interval that these are added using the keyword dir underscore interval. Um, and that's just in seconds. So since it's so hard to see them, I, I updated it from 60 seconds to 10 seconds. And that should make them much more uh, clear on the figure. And one important thing to note is that if the, if the B field or the uh, spacecraft direction uh, data, spacecraft position data aren't um, at 10 second resolution, if they're higher resolution, then they'll be at the resolution of the data. So for instance, the spacecraft RAM direction 
is actually once every 30 seconds. So if we say once every 10 seconds, it's really still going to get once every 30 seconds. Um, however, the B field data is at very high resolution. So we request once every 10 seconds, we, we get the B field at once every 10 seconds. And now you can uh, clearly see there's uh, the direction of the B field as well as the direction of the spacecraft ram direction added to the plots. So <clears throat> I mentioned the multi-pad option. Let's go ahead and show that. So to show off the multi-pad option, I'm going to, uh, I've set a new time range of 10 minutes and pretty sure we all have a pretty good idea of how long it takes to, to run these MMR part get spec calculations. Um, but the main uh, idea behind multi-pad, as I mentioned earlier, is to be able to generate pitch angle distributions at various energies um, very quickly without having to do these calculations over and over and over again. So the multi-pad option creates a new t-plot variable with the pad, uh, so it's, it ends with the pad or with the name pad. And this is slightly different from the pitch angle distribution variable, which is just PA. And to generate the pitch angle distributions from the multi-pad option, you call MMS part get pad and specify the energy range. If you don't specify an energy range, it does the full energy range. But the main reason we have uh, the get pad option or routine is to specify different energy ranges and generate the uh, pitch angle distributions at various energy ranges very, very quickly. So, and for those of you not familiar with the TikTok, this uh, times a load routine or times thing. So if you call tick and then call a car or do a load routine call and then call talk. It'll tell you exactly how long it took to, to do that one line. So it should be almost there. And all of this is just 10 minutes of data. So these calculations can take a while to actually uh, complete, especially if you have a longer time range. there. All right, so that, let's see, from the took about 200 seconds to do that calculation. And that includes all the loading the data and everything. Um, just calling MMS part products to do the calculation itself took 83 seconds. So it took more than a minute just to do the calculations. Um, took a couple minutes just to load the data, the support data. Um, so, but now you notice there's a variable called pad. So we can, uh, data structure. So now the pitch angle variable is a function of energy and angle. So we can call MMS part get pad and generate pitch angle distributions at various energy ranges and see how quickly that, that happened. We generated the pitch angle distributions from zero to 100 EV, 100 EV to 1000 EV, and then 1 keV to 10 keV, 10 keV to 20 keV, and 20 keV to 30 keV. And 
bottom. You can see that's much, 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 much faster um, with the multi pad option. And again, you can, I showed flattened spectra earlier on uh, energy spectra. Of course, this also works on pitch angle distributions. You can just that. So now we have the uh, energy flux on the left, or on the, yeah, on the left and energy on the bottom. Actually, no, on the bottom, it's not energy, it's uh, pitch angle. That's right. So what we really don't want is X log. We don't want the pitch angle to be on a log scale. So let's try without X log. And then let's just click there. There we go. So now we have pitch angle on the bottom in degrees and energy flux on the left. And then each variable has a, a legend or specified in the legend. So the 10K EV to 20K EV is the red line. And the 100 EV to 1K EV is the blue line. And let's see some other useful keywords. I'm actually going to load some. Uh, Generate the energy spectra for a time when the spacecraft is in the solar wind. Um, so I can show off the subtract bulk keyword as well as uh, subtract error, and subtract spin tone. And so let's open up that's my good spec. And so subtract error subtracts the distribution error, and this only works for FBI data. And <clears throat> it subtracts the distribution error from the data prior to actually doing the calculation. And subtract spin tone subtracts the FBI spin tone from the bulk velocity data prior to subtracting the bulk velocity. Um, Wait, what is the specific. error? That's the Poisson distribution error. And uh, let's see, it's stored in, let's see, I can actually have another copy of IDL. So FBI. Show you what the error variable looks like. Let me just load it into some copy of IDL. Oops. I prepped the wrong program. So the best source of information on the error is probably. Probably the SDC and the team notes. So, data sets, FBI, and there's going to be a data products guide. And see, I don't know where the PDF is. It's the release notes. Let's see. So this is the dist error, the sky map instrument distribution one sigma error. And that's the variable that's subtracted from the distribution, which is this, the sky map instrument distribution. And that's only done if you uh, specify that keyword. And I know that they don't do that by default when they do their calculations for FBI for the moments files. Okay, so now we generated the energy spectra for FBI for ions for this uh, two minutes time span. And this is when FPI is in the solar wind. So there's a solar wind right below 1 keV. And in this next example, we're going to subtract the bulk velocity, subtract the spin tone from the bulk velocity prior to subtracting the bulk velocity, and subtract the distribution error from the distribution. And since it's the solar wind, subtracting out the bulk velocity should shift this peak down 
to close to zero EV. At least that's what we expect. So we generated the energy spectra and notice that the, the peak in the energy spectra shifted down to zero or close to zero as it's supposed to. So if you plot the ion uh, spectra in the solar wind and subtract out the, the solar wind, the peak shifts down to zero. To zero. So now um, I guess we can move on to the 2D velocity slices from the distributions. Um, this is a uh, relatively new routine. Um, those of you familiar with SPD underscore uh, slice2D, this is MMS part slice2D calls that one underneath. So it's like MMS part get spec and MMS part products. Um, uh, MMS part slice2D is just a wrapper around SPD slice2D that uh, loads the support data required for doing the calculations and then calls SPD slice2D to do the calculations and then calls SPD slice 2D plot to create the plot. So the idea is to have um, essentially a single routine call that loads all the support data, sets up the calculations, does the calculations, and creates the plot. So uh, first we're gonna use a time, the time keyword and just set the time um, to do it at 9.30 on uh, September 10th, 2017. And this is uh, similar, the same example from the initial introduction load routines up above. And just like MMS part products, it has all the same keywords for controlling the instrument, the species, uh, probe. So here we go. Now we have a 2D distribution slice for FPI. And this only has one timestamp. Um, if you want to generate more, uh, change the time range, do more averaging. There are keywords for all of that. And instead of checking the, the header for MMS part slice 2D, I suggest checking the header for SPD slice 2D because it has way better documentation for all the features. And we essentially just uh, push all of the request keywords that go to MMS part slice 2D to, to, down to SPD slice 2D. So it, uh, this should accept, uh, the wrapper should accept all the same options that the underlying routine accepts. So this is the full energy range. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the big, the cool thing about the MMS part slice 2D and the MMS part get spec is that you can control uh, various options like the energy range. Um, instead of the keyword being energy though, here it's E range. The reason is there's another keyword for energy um, that converts the axes from velocity space to energy space. So if you specify an energy keyword here, it'll convert this from uh, velocity space to energy space. So using the E range keyword, we were able to limit the energy range from zero to 300 EV. And this is what we get. And uh, so I mentioned that uh, we pass all the same op or all the options down to SPD slice 2D so we can specify a rotation. Um, and the rotation options are specified in the header of SPD slice 2D. So you can do uh, BV, which is the X axis is parallel to the B field and the bulk velocity defines the X, Y plane. We're gonna go ahead and do that one while limiting the energy range from zero to 300 EV. And again, there are a bunch of other options for rotations. Um, so just check the header for uh, the rotation that you're looking for. You can also set custom rotations. 
Um, I just set an actual custom rotation matrix to do the rotation. Um, there are lots of options to, to this routine. Right, so now we have the, so the only difference between this call and the call above is that we specified the rotation BV. So you can see now we're on, where we have the axes where uh, the X axis is parallel to the B field and the bulk velocity defines the X, Y plane. So, and, uh -oh. So the next, uh, oh, finally, okay. So that's FPI. We're gonna generate the same figure for HBCA. We just have to specify instrument equals HBCA and species H plus instead of the I for FPI. So we can generate the exact same figure except for using HBCA data instead of the FPI data. So it's not gonna be the exact same figure. It should be very similar structure though. And of course, there are keywords for controlling uh, the output. So you can set flux instead of, uh, by default, it just does the distribution function. Um, if you specify flux, it'll calculate the, it'll do the conversion to flux. Uh, for MMS part slice 2D, you have to loop outside the call. For this routine, uh, they don't. Yes, while this is loading the support data, we can show some more of the keywords. So there's a keyword for plotting the bulk velocity direction. Um, and there's a keyword for plotting the sun direction. And that'll just add the direction. And I think the bulk velocity is added by default. Um, and it's hard to see, but there's a small red line that points in the direction of the bulk velocity in this figure. And we also have a keyword that uh, turns, instead of having a, a small arrow to the bulk velocity, there's also a keyword that turns, let's see if I can remember what the keyword was. It essentially adds another axis to the, to the location. Let's see. Oh yeah, another important keyword is SBDF. All these routines support loading the data from SBDF instead of the last best DC. So if you if you ever have a time where there's um the last best DC is down, and you're having trouble loading data, just give it the SBDF keyword and it'll go grab the same data from SBDF instead of last. And 
So I've been using the time to grab the time closest in all of these loader team calls. You could also give it a T range keyword to average over a time range. And here's HBCA. So the same figure as before from HBCA. Let's see, do we still have that? Might not have that window open. It replaced the, the FBI window with this one. But again, you can see the same uh, bi-directional beam there. And I mentioned you can specify units of flux to output the, uh, instead of giving the slice to the distribution function, it gives a slice to the flux. Actually, I'm gonna try a reset just to see if things load faster now. So, so there's a, just a question. I, I was wondering on the plots. So you're not you're not you're just indicating the velocity, right? You're not translating into that frame, correct? Can you repeat that? So, so I was wondering with the with your with these plots, you're indicating on those plots the direction of the of the bulk velocity, or are you actually translating into that frame? We're actually when indicating you, the direction. Okay, just in okay. Just wanted to make sure. Thanks. Yep. Yep. And so, so this example shows units converted to flux. So instead of distribution function uh, units or DF units, we have units of flux. Um, and that actually occurs inside the wrapper MS part slice 2D. Uh, there's a routine here that converts the distribution to, to different units. So uh, now we can, here's another example. Like this is our example from earlier when we were looking at the solar wind. And remember we subtracted out the solar wind and the energy shifted down to zero. Um, so in this case, we plotted the solar wind and you can see the peak is off the center slightly. That's because uh, we haven't subtracted the bulk velocity. So we can provide the keyword subtract bulk, subtract bulk velocity. And what we'd expect here since it's in the solar wind is for this uh, origin to shift to the peak of the distribution. And you can see that's what happened. So the origin is now in the peak. So that was just from subtracting the bulk velocity. And um, just like MMS part gets spec, we also have to subtract the error, or we can subtract the error from the bulk velocity. Or, sorry, the. We subtract the error from the distribution function prior to doing the calculations um, and subtracting the bulk velocity. And here's what we get. All right, so <clears throat> moving on, we're going to. Um, now to combine the energy spectra, or the time series, with the 2D slices. Um, first, we're going to let's go ahead and load some FPI data and some FGM data, some moments data. And <clears throat> I'm going to create a plot with FGM data on top, um, some ion number density, ion uh, bulk velocity, and the iron energy spectra. And the reason I'm loading the FGM data, um, I'm, I wanted to show that you can create a T plot plot with pretty much any variables that you load. And then this tool, MMS Flipbookify, can work on any T plot window. So um, the actual parameters in the T plot window that you're creating, uh, these don't really matter so much. You can add whatever you want. So just as an introduction, while well, these calculations are being done, 
uh, MMS Flipbook if I takes the T-plot window like this one or any other T-plot window and adds the 2D slices from before and the essentially opens up a right-hand margin and then adds the wind, those slices to the margin. And it adds three slices at a time and it defaults to, let's go to MMS Flipbook flip. Uh, the actual slices shown, the three slices are, uh, you specify them using the slices keyword, but by default it shows XY, XZ, and YC. So let's go ahead and do those calculations. And a new keyword that was added um, to MMS Flipbook by a seconds. So you could specify how many seconds between each, uh, each interval. So. So what this does is it adds the slices and then saves it at each timestamp. Um, it also adds a vertical line at the timestamp to show, so here we go. You can see the vertical dashed line is the time which the slices are being calculated. And by default, MMS Flipbookify uses the timestamps from the top panel, the data on the top panel. Um, if you weren't, if you didn't specify seconds equals 10, it would use each timestamp in that top panel. And uh, a word of warning, if you have FGM data up there, that could be millions of timestamps. So it's uh, good to think about how many seconds uh, you want to specify and or either specify the number of timestamps using the timestamps keyword or the number of seconds between uh, figures using the seconds keyword. Um, but as I mentioned, we have the uh, VX versus VY distribution, uh, VX versus VZ, and VY versus VZ. And it creates it at each timestamp and it saves them in a folder called Flipbookify or Flipbook in your default or your ideal working directory. So I actually have a lot of these probably from many, many, many. By default, it creates PNGs. Um, there are keywords for creating other. Uh, so for that example, we showed F, uh, FPI. We can also do HBCA. Oops. So in this example, we load HBCA moments data and create a similar plot to before with FG, or, yeah, FGM on the top. And then this time we have HPCA number density and then HPCA ion bulk velocity and then the HPCA energy spectra. Although that's probably not gonna plot since we reset. So this time it'll just be these three variables, the FGM data and the FGM number density. So three variables, of course you can also say, now it's gonna do, do MMS Flipbookify, and it's going to do the HPCA H plus. And we're going to limit the energy range again from zero to 300 EB. So now I should just do the calculations. We can watch as it saves the files to the Flipbook folder. And you can control the output folder using the keywords. You could control pretty much everything about these calculations using the keywords, actually. So I suggest checking out the, the header of this routine um, for learning how to do other things. Um, like you could change the, the interpolation method of the slices, uh, change the X range, Y range. I'm gonna do that in a few examples down. See. And we're also going to show how to turn all these, uh, the series of images into a video. Um, so there's the first one and the second one. And you might notice that there's a solid, uh, <clears throat> a solid vertical line in this example. And that is because the T range keyword, 
if you specify a T range, it will draw vertical lines at the time, at the start and end time, if possible. So if you specified a time range of, uh, say, 932 to 933, it would draw vertical lines between 932 and 933, and it would only show the uh, time steps between those. It would only save the time stamps between those. So here, and notice that each file name has the timestamp down to the, uh, down to fractional seconds. So. <clears throat> and so this is essentially the HPCA example from the, uh, or from the same, uh, from ions, just like FPI above. Another example would be to specify the X range and Y range keywords. This time we're gonna just show FBI again. I think it takes longer to load the HBCA data. But in this example, we're gonna specify a different set of slices. Um, so we're gonna do the field align slice and then the perp and perp XY. If you wanna know what those stand for, perp is again in the header of SPD slice 2D. Purpose just the x-axis is the bulk velocity projected onto the uh, plane normal to the B field, and then y is uh, B cross V. And here we go. You notice that we're uh, that we specified the x range and the y range keywords, and so they updated the x range and y range keywords, so that we're zoomed in to the distribution. Again, the, the bottom uh, the bottom distribution slice is uh, BB versus uh, uh, the plane or B or yeah BB, which was the X is per parallel to the B field, and the bulk velocity defines the XY plane. And so you can see that uh, bidirectional beam here. Right. So, and then the next example, the final example, um, the only difference between this one and the last one is I specify the video keyword. So that should save uh, each, should save the, the series of images as a video as well. So. <clears throat> And get by default, the uh, the file names have all the, the relevant information, like the instrument and the species and the exact timestamp for the, the figure. And you can see now that we're, in addition to generating the uh, PNGs, we're also generating uh, an MP4 file that has the, the video. And looks like it's done. So now we can run our video and should just time step through. And there are also keywords for controlling uh, the video format and uh, the number of frames per second. Generally the best uh, way of controlling the video though is just controlling the number of seconds in the output or the number of time steps, um, just do more time steps if possible. 
and more time steps to make for a longer video. All right, finally, the, uh, the last is um, this new wrapper called MMS part IC3D. And uh, those of you familiar with the uh, IC3D tool, that's the tool that was developed at, um, in Japan. And let's go ahead and open IC3D. <clears throat> So I think this documentation is actually in. Just to wrap around still 3D. So those of you who are familiar with using IC3D, you previously had to, uh, of course, set up the support data and then uh, call IC3D after returning the distribution and then converting the distribution to a data structure that, that uh, is supported by IC3D. And you would have to convert the units to PSD. Um, so essentially, MMS part IC3D does everything for you to set up the 3D distributions. So as an example, we're just gonna set time, stand, time span of 30 seconds and then call IC3D ion data. And an important thing to note is that IC3D has to have at least three timestamps for it to work. It averages the data and it has to, actually, I don't think it averages the data, it just loads in multiple timestamps and it definitely crashes if you don't have enough timestamps. And that should be in the warning and the, that warnings in the crib sheet as well. And it's also important to note that IC3D, the, the tool that's um, underlying this wrapper is actually still under development and there's probably uh, more than a few bugs. So if you find a bug, if you run into a bug with IC3 or something that you don't understand or uh, send me an email, let me know. Cause it could very well be a problem since this is uh, hot off the press, it's brand new. It's almost there. And there we go. So we have a bunch of errors. I would ignore these errors, but I'm gonna have to look into why they are created. It looks like there's a zero ball and tetrahedron somewhere. But this is the distribution. Of course, we have these options to control it in 3D so you can limit the range. <clears throat> and this is FPI ions. Um, again, just like the other routines, it defaults to FPI data. Um, but if you call with instrument HPCA, set the species to H plus, so use the H plus data from HPCA as well. So actually can't control the window while it's doing calculations in the background but we can't talk about it. So change the ranges. Uh, these vectors allow you to plot uh, the B field vector as well as the uh, bulk velocity vector. And they are added by default to the plots. I think uh, the, I'll have to click on that to figure out which is which.
Should really work on speeding these things up. should be creating the plot. All right, so here's the HPCA. And again, we can go to the vector, and you can see the magnetic field vector. That's the cayenne vector. So we can't really see it, so we could change the range. Let's try changing the DZ range slightly. So you see the cayenne vector, that's the magnetic field vector, and it's going in uh, and the velocity vector, that's the, the bulk velocity vector, it's the yellow one. There, for some reason, that's NANS, so that's probably a mistake. There's a problem there. <clears throat> and so it defaults to uh, a volume. You can also change to scatter plot. And you can change to ISO surfaces. But I think volume looks the best. And you can change the plane of view. Let's see. So another they're off to add slices to the figure. To add the slice, you can click image. You can also remove the volume and then uh, change where your slice actually is by just moving the slider. You can add another a slice to another plane, slide it around. And of course you got contours. So that's pretty much all I have for the webinar. Are there any uh, questions or confusions? Any any examples I could show? So you mentioned that uh, there are structure helps we can do to figure out all the keywords or plots or IDL options. Is there a, a master list somewhere that you, know, you can deal with the map for say the colors or determining the velocity of the assets and things like that? Hmm. So for plot options, I gen what I do is go to the actual IDL op options for plots. So actually that won't work, but if you go IDL plot, and you have to go to the IDL plot procedure rather than the plot function. So for the most part, options, the options command accepts all the graphics keywords um, that these accept. And it actually just passes through down to plot so if you wanted to set, say, um, there are a few uh, special ones like colors. It's actually special. So pretty much everything uh, in a plot you can change. Say, we could say, uh, let's just do an example where we control something strange or where we just lose some FPI data. In general, though, I say check the headers, but for plot options, uh, go to the plot procedure documentation in IDL, and you should be able to set pretty much all of these. Um, I think colors is a special one. 
and for uh, verbosity, we have a tool in Speedus called uh, D, where we try to use. Uh, let's try. Let's put another one while these are loading data. I can try to set the verbosity. So we have a routine for setting the verbosity. I think it's verbosity set. I can't remember it now, but I can find it. Oh, there it is. Set verbose. So set verbose and. The default level is two. Um, what that would do is pre pretty much everything. You want to see. So default verbosity, it, it shows all the creating tplot variables and everything. You could also set the verbose to, let's see. I think the lower shows more. Maybe. Okay, so I'm wrong about that. For some reason, that's not working. Hmm. That's strange. Still loaded here. All right, so for some reason that didn't work. So one thing to note is that if you're calling a bunch of, uh, especially the MMS part slice 2D and the uh, MMS IC 3D routines, they might mess up your keyplot window. They, um, colors, and if that happens, just do a reset session and start over. There's also uh, SVD graphics config that you could call that sets up the graphics config that might get around that. But generally, I just reset the session. So here, we can just pick a random option. Let's say boom, X ticks. So it's our Y ticks. So you say options, variable name that you want. So we're plotting the number density here. So you can say y ticks equals one, two. You can see it updated it. Uh, uh, so we changed y ticks. And we can also change the y thick. Why not? And make it say 10. Basically, all of these options and the plot procedure documentation are accepted by options, the options command. And another routine I didn't show is tplot underscore options. And tplot underscore options is just like options, except it sets it for uh, global instead of, so instead of setting, say, we could say tplot options, y thick, six, for some reason that didn't work. Oh, that's because tplot options, you can't set like that. You have to set things like this. And then we're going to plot. So tplot options works on uh, all the variables and all the current plots, um, while options works on one specific variable. And another thing to note is that same format also works for uh, options, so you should be able to say like y thick equals, or and if it's like one. You can see it updated that just that one variable to back to the default of one. 
and for let's see this is the routine that prints out the different um levels of verbosity and for some reason that was not working earlier But it should say in here how to set the current debug level. Is two is the default and set verbose. I think if you said zero, it should be much quieter. Oh, there's something wrong here, but. Definitely something. Yeah. And a set verbose. Let's see. Okay, so this time it actually worked. When I set the verbosity to zero, notice that it didn't print the creating T plot variables. Um, so uh, the verbosity of zero means that it. Um, it only prints error messages. So if there were an error, it should print out the error. Uh, but it doesn't say print uh, creating tplot variable messages. And that's a good way to save a bunch of time loading variables is to change the verbosity to only print the errors. But as for how to figure out how to do this, you would have to email me and pretty much ask because this is one of those uh, strange, it's just one of those things that you, I don't know if there's any real good documentation anywhere. We could probably add it to a crib sheet or something. So that's pretty much all I have. Any other questions or examples I can show? If not, if you think of a question, um, let me know, just send me an email. I'm going to add this to, again, I'm going to add this script to the uh, webinars folder so you can go download it and run it. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to add it today. It should be in there this afternoon, um, tomorrow at the latest. Again, projects, MMS, examples, webinars. And I'm going to try to put this, uh, the video on YouTube, assuming that it actually saves correctly. Uh, so thanks for calling in, following along.